Welcome everyone to the May 28th campfire chat. Um, we have Mikey, who's gonna be talking a little bit more about, I'm not going to say uh, hosting. So uh, Mikey, you can expand on that um, and I'll turn it over to you. Hi, so my name's Michael, Mikey. Um, I run an IT firm out of Cardiff in South Wales in the United Kingdom. And uh, we look after the IT systems in a holistic fashion for nonprofit organizations primarily. We do have some for-profit customers, but most of our client base are nonprofits. Uh, so that means we look after everything from their desktops and laptops up to and including systems like CVCRM. Um, we offer CVCRM as a managed service. So on a, uh, I think what the, marketing folks would probably describe it as SaaS, software as a service. Um, so CVCRM with us and the way we host and manage CVCRM is a different perspective to the traditional kind of get a, get, a, get a server with a hosting company and you know put Linux on it and then put a web server on it and a database. For us, it's hosted in a containerized setup. Uh, it's hosted according to our system and, and our build requirements with very little customization available to our clients and our customer base. We give them a CRM that can do all of the, the major functions they want from a nonprofit CRM, but here's the key. For us, every customer's CV CRM environment is identical to every other customer. So when we do things like upgrade CV CRM, we, we test it against a small subset of sites and then we push to the, the, the batch of 41 sites that are running at any one time. So our perspectives and our methodologies are different. Um, and I'm hoping kind of with Al having Alan here, Alan is much more able to flesh out some of the more kind of traditional hosting aspects and, and self-hosting aspects that I might not necessarily be familiar with because we approach this as a managed service and not as a, a hosting. And I, I put that in air quotes because um, when we were planning this and kind of working what we were going to talk about, uh, Alan pointed out, and, and I had to kind of think about the, the point for a couple of seconds, but Alan uh, pointed out in, in our discussion that um, the term kind of host, which is talked about as this thing, you know, you have a host for CVCRM. But actually, Alan pointed out, it's not, it's not a thing. It's not a, it's, it doesn't have to be a single entity even. It's a collection of functions. It's a collection of, of um, services or, or parts that come together to form the environment in which you run CVCRM. And I think most quote unquote hosts do more than just provide hosting space or, or, or a hosting service. They also monitor your CVCRM and upgrade your CVCRM and configure your CVCRM. And that there's a, often there's more of a relationship that's service provider, service consumer, than there is hosting provider like you would get for a website. Um, and I think that's important to talk about or, or to think about CVCRM hosting when you're going into this. If, you, if you're going into this brand new, try and think of your CVCRM if you're working with a provider as a managed service and not just someone hosting it for you. I think it, it means you're looking for different things. And I think it means that when you go into this from a, a project planning side, you will end up with a better relationship if you go into this looking for a partner to work with on your CVCRM than going into this looking just for someone to provide you with service base. Because Chances are, if you're working with a partner, if you're working with the likes of um, Blackfly Solutions or, uh, or um, uh, CV Desk or uh, Veda or CompuCorp or um, Artful Robot, these are providers in our community who might, they might quote unquote host your CVCRM, but they're doing a lot more than just, than what GoDaddy might do if you go to GoDaddy for hosting. Um, so it's worth kind of considering the value add that, that the service provider relationship has in terms of hosting. So when we spoke 
uh, in advance of this about what those services were. We tried to come up with a bit of a list um, and full credit to Alan. Um, I think Alan came up with the entire list and I chimed in at the very end and said, that's a good list. Um, so the list kind of Alan came up with was um, those services that you need to host CVCRM in production. So to host CVCRM, you need a physical machine at some level. It's got to live on some kind of host. Um, there's got to be some, some kind of metal and some silicon in there to, to get it going. Um, now, for a lot of people hosting CVCRM, that's abstracted away into what we might think of as compute power. So you might have a virtual machine, you might have a, a set of containers, or you might be, you know, like we do, you might be hosting on something like Microsoft Azure, where you pay per minute of, of actual compute cycle that you use. Um, our, our, our hosting cost for that kind of compute resource depends on how much of it we consume, rather than paying for something too big or too small. Um, it, it's very much kind of paid at the size that, that we consume. Um, so then you've got the operating system uh, and, and kind of keeping that up to date and maintaining that as a, as a distinct thing from the physical machine or the virtual machine. You've got a stack of machine services, PHP, MySQL, um, Apache, Nginx, uh, Lightspeed, Traffic, whatever, whatever combination of web server, database, and PHP system you're running. Again, those have to be kept up to date. Those have to be managed. <laughs> and every every layer up you go, every every kind of layer that we add to this stack has complexity because it depends on the things below it and affects the things above it. So you can't just go to your host and upgrade P PHP. If you're on a shared hosting, upgrading PHP affects everybody else on the server. Uh, so they might not be willing to do that. And yet Civi might need a better version of PHP or a newer version of PHP. And if you don't think of these when you're planning, and if you don't think of these in advance and check them out, uh, we, we, we see it a lot in the community. We see people come in and they're sort of, oh, I've got this shared hosting account and CVCRM won't work. And it's because they're running PHP 5.6 and CVCRM now requires 7.1. So you've got to match up what Civi requires, what the CMS requires, and what the host can give you, uh, what the, the provider can give you. Backup strategy and practice. It's kind of item four in this in this stack of services. Code management, uh, being able to manage the CVCRM, the CMS code, uh, making sure it's kept up to date, but also making sure it's managed in such a way that avoids conflicts and respects any custom code or custom integrations or configuration you have. Support for when things go wrong. We, we all go into this hoping we'll never need support. Um, and I think probably every single one of us has needed some kind of support with hosting uh, the CVCRM uh, instances. Uh, myself and and you know myself and many of the other kind of providers or, or 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 service partners out there in the community, we're not we're not alien to this. You know, we we probably ask for support as much uh, as much as if not more than the people who kind of self-host their own CVCRM instances. And I say this to mean never feel bad about seeking support from the community. Pop into Mattermost, come and ask us questions. These events that Roshni is organizing are fantastic. Um, and they're fantastic for many reasons because they give us an opportunity to share kind of good practices and, and, and talk and get to know each other. But they're also fantastic because they serve as a useful reminder that when we come together as a community to help each other, everyone is stronger for that interaction and everyone is better for that interaction. So if you have questions or if you're having persistent problems, jump into Mattermost, post a question on Stack Exchange, hop onto GitLab and file an issue. There's, there's so many ways you can kind of get involved with the community and ask us questions. And for the most part, there's, there's a whole bunch of us willing and ready to answer and help. And then the, the kind of final item after support um, for, for our kind of little list of services that we came up with that, that Alan came up with there was the um, having a partner who can help you build the, the your, your kind of instance of Civi and get it configured but also help you build new features custom code um, perhaps tweak existing features write patches um, <laughs> it's that final layer of support that goes from 
just taking CVSRM out of out of the box and putting it on a server to using CVSRM in a way that's customized and most effective for your organization. CVSRM is is generic. It's we've got a major advantage over some of the, some products like Salesforce or Dynamics 365, those big enterprise CRMs, because we're targeted at charities. But every charity is unique. And CVCRM is one of the few systems that gives you the flexibility to adapt it to meet your specific requirements, either through custom code, changing core code, not recommended, but always an option, uh, extensions, uh, CMS integrations. Uh, you know, we've got unparalleled CMS integrations that I don't think any other CRM can boast. Uh, being able to utilize all of those for your charity is where CVCRM can go from being a really useful CRM tool to being the hub of your organization that actually helps you work more efficiently, spend more time with your beneficiaries, and put you know your 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 dollars or your pounds to better work. You know, not 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 using them to do repetitive admin, but using them to benefit your your kind of your, your your targets or achieve your your mission, your values. And I think that's important, and that's how we like to talk about CVCRM with our clients. Is it's not we 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 don't pitch CVCRM so we can make money. We don't pitch CVCRM because the charities need a CRM particularly, or they need CVCRM particularly. We pitch it because um, CVCRM gives charities the ability to help spend more time, more face time with the people they should be spending face time with, and less time sitting in the offices and sitting at desks and typing out repetitive notes or doing repetitive admin processes. And we got a bunch of extensions and, and a bunch of kind of wizards. Uh, I, I, I'd love to highlight kind of Rich and Artful Robot, his company here. Because again, some of this stuff Rich has done around process automation and, and kind of like marketing and journey automation in CVCRM, rival commercial um, like donor management platforms and marketing automation platforms. Uh, the Chasse extension, one that we, we, we have that as part of our standard build for all customers. Um, and it lets them, you know, do that. Someone contacted us via our con. Uh, someone sent us a donation. So we'll put them in a list, and then we'll send them a message. Uh, when that donation campaign ends, we'll send them a message telling them how it went, and ask them if they want to donate to our new campaign. And it's all automated. It, there's no one there clicking buttons. You set the rules. You just kick the process off, and it's, you know, it, it's it can save you hours, hours a month, um, which is fantastic. So working kind of down the list in terms of what we do, just to give you a brief overview. We host all of our sites on Microsoft Azure. Um, so they're all containerized. So they all run on Docker, uh, where we have a container that holds CVCRM. And we have a container that runs PHP. We have a container that runs the database. We have a container that runs the web service. Uh, they're all independent and we can kind of tweak versions and upgrade bits of them without having to necessarily redo an entire server or, or migrate or take things down and up and it's it's it gives us a lot more advantage but it's way more complex to manage um our backups similarly straight back into microsoft azure and then depending on the customer uh, or client they can they can copy that elsewhere if they need to Code management, we, we version control all our code using GitLab, which is what CVCRM itself uses for extensions. We use that internally. So all of our all of our sites are managed through GitLab um, and deployed from GitLab. So again, it's, it's quite an automatic process for us. Um, we run a 24 seven help desk internally, um, which is always fun when you get calls in the middle of the night that you have to deal with. Um, and we, the, the one where we kind of, you know, as I said, this package of services, we don't really do item seven on our list. We don't really do support for building new features or custom code. We have a custom extension that we developed um, that does some configuration stuff for all our sites. And we have a couple of custom extensions that we've contributed to the community to do other things. And we're working on a Twitter integration because one of our customers wants to, wants to fund it and wants us to build it. But generally, what we do with those is we build them, we release them, and then we deploy them to all, all of the sites at the same time. Uh, 
So everybody will get the Twitter functionality when it's finished in our kind of pool of sites all at the same time, um, which makes it hilarious when we do introduce bugs and we're not, you know, we're, 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 we're a human team. Um, I, I would be, I'd be lying if I told you we, I hadn't single-handedly taken down 41 CBCRM sites on a Friday afternoon at four o'clock. Uh, that's happened at least once, probably more. Um, so understanding what goes into hosting CVSRM is important because uh, it's, it's your baseline. And there, there comes a point then where you, you've worked out what your requirements are. You've kind of worked out and tested maybe installing locally. So you know it's going to work and you've evaluated and it works for your, um, your needs. So how do you pick this provider? Uh, and I think that's kind of what it would be great to, it'd be great for us to have one recommended provider that we could go to and we could say, go with these guys, they're, they're, they're always great. It doesn't exist. There isn't one provider for every CV site because every CV site and every organization using CV Serum is unique. For some organizations, they, they have to do this on their own. There's no budget. Uh, I'm, the, I'm, I'm a, a trustee for a charity in the UK. We have an annual budget. Uh, our, our kind of full annual budget is seventy-seven thousand pounds, so just just about enough to pay for our two staff members and run our building. They're using CPCRM, but there's no way they have the kind of ability to pay for someone to manage CPCRM for them on a monthly or yearly basis. It would, it's just it's not within their budgetary planning and where they are financially as an organisation. Uh, and there are many small charities or small organizations around the world who would benefit or and do benefit from CIVI, but definitely can't afford to take the step up to have someone or some organization manage it and support it on a monthly basis. Um, and for them, shared hosting is often where they can, where they can afford to put it. Uh, I don't like shared hosting. Um, I'm, I'm always a bit skeptical of, of shared hosting as a, as a general rule for things like CRMs. You're putting very valuable, very private customer data on a, on a shared server that you have no real control over. That's not to say don't use shared hosting. It's to say, think carefully about where you go for shared hosting, make sure it meets the requirements. And make sure you're doing it with someone, with an organization that you trust to manage it responsibly. You don't want shared hosting that's not installing security updates for PHP or their web server appropriately. Um, you want to make sure you're with a shared host that has some appreciation and some care for the, the security of your organization and the data you're, you're entrusting to them. Virtual private servers would be the next step up from shared hosting. Um, so this is where you're kind of Again, you're, you're still sharing compute resources on a physical machine, but you're renting a, a distinct part of it that you can manage in a much more bespoke way. Often you have root control and you have the ability to um, help or, or to, to, to configure things yourself from a root. You can choose your own um, web server, your own SQL server version. Uh, you've got a lot more control downside, immediate downside that's probably become obvious to, to, to some of you, you're responsible for your security when it comes to a VPS. You know, it's very easy to get a virtual private server with something like cPanel or Plesk on it. Uh, and it seems like shared hosting. It seems like it's kind of very, very turnkey. You know, you, you give them your credit card details and they give you a login for Plesk and you're, you're up and away. But with most virtual private servers, they're not doing much in terms of managing the security or the configuration. It's, it's often very much down to you as the customer to manage that on your own. So when you're evaluating virtual private servers, you've got to make sure you've got someone who knows that they have to keep it up to date and, and knows or can do the research or ask the questions to make sure it's configured in a way that's secure and in a reasonable fashion. Uh, stepping up dedicated CPUs, which is what uh, Roshni is talking about. So these are where you're, read, you're, you're renting an entire physical server, oftentimes, or, a, or a, a blade, like a micro server in some cases, 
and you have you know everything from that kind of the, the, the bare metal operating system up but someone else is hosting it and providing the connectivity same problems as vps is in that you're 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 essentially self-managing largely you can get managed dedicated servers and the price goes up if you add management or, or security support on top of them so you've got to think through all of this when you're specking how you're hosting and i think um you know if if, if someone was to write a checklist for what to think of when you're going into hosting you know the the, the part of the, the 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 kind of slightly ocd part in my personality that's always ticking away with checklisty things has has probably got like a 500 point checklist in it that i could write out for how to pick hosting no one would ever use it because it would take you a week to get through it but you you know you can get as complicated as you want when trying to evaluate hosts because everything is in play when it comes to kind of comparing so dedicated cpu you can then go to hosting it yourself if you've got your own servers you can you can set it up again from the bare metal and host cvcrm and there are many organizations i know of uh, who host cvcrm inside their own uh, local network it's not it's not web accessible to anybody outside of the organization they host it themselves it's only accessible internally um, and if they do have some external stuff feeding in it's done over cvcrm's api with tight security controls so if you have very high security requirements um, you can you can run CBCRM on anything that runs PHP, realistically. It's more or less supported depending on where you go. But if you go with you know a well-known Linux distribution, chances are someone else is running on the same distribution. Uh, I I think I've seen companies who use everything from kind of CentOS through to Mint Linux to run CBCRM. No one seems to have many major issues caused by what they choose. Windows servers again grain of salt very few people running on windows in production with civi so again if you're looking at windows hosting if it's something that you've thought about you've got to be aware that you're scaling down your available support pool within the community because the more niche you get in your civi CRM service stack uh the harder it is to find support because when you get to an obscure issue you have to find someone else who's running very in a very similar way to you to find someone who's likely to have experienced the same problem um so again the the more common you keep your hosting environment the more support you'll find because chances are someone else is using a very similar setup and i think the most common is probably going to be php fpm apache mysql or mariadb I think would probably be the, the most common kind of base config for running CVCRM. It's quite a few people running Nginx. Um, and again, when you get into containers, all of that goes off the rails and people start getting weird and wonderful. Um, I think at the moment we're running Trafic, which is relatively young as a web server, um, reverse proxy system, always good fun. Um, so I'm gonna kind of chime in Alan here because I'm not sure if he's got any weird disagreements with anything i've said well not sorry not weird disagreements how rude excuse me i'm not sure if alan has any disagreements with anything i said or any kind of major corrections or differences i'd be interested to to his perspective on what i've said um and also to kind of then take you through a different perspective because i think alan's approach to hosting cv crm is a uh, probably more refined alan's been doing this for a lot longer but also it comes from a very different perspective we come at this as a as a as a managed service as a managed it service not we don't come at it from the cvcrm first end and i think alan comes at this from a cvcrm first end and it's very much uh, probably a much more cvcrm focused perspective that you'll get from alan which is incredibly useful and i think you know of the of the people in the cvcrm community uh, everyone I talk to who has sites hosted by Alan or who has had sites hosted by Alan generally gives me a rave review to the point where I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in kind of Alan's geographic area, but I'd like Alan to host a CDCRM site for me. I think he's one of the people I'd go to. So over to you, Alan. Am I on? Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that review. Uh, so my name is 
Alan, how long do I have, Roshani? Um, let's see, you have until like 1.20, so we have at least 10 minutes for chat. The Perfect. So about 20 minutes. More like um, before 10, we 10 15, get started, so we get now, chatting. Alan, did oh. you need to share your screen? Yes, I, I'm uh, trying no. to find Alan so I can spotlight him. Yes, sorry. Is your video on, Alan? Yep. Okay, great. Excellent. I'm going to spotlight Alan. Awesome. So, do you need to share your screen? Uh, no, not right now. I can do that later great. if anybody wants me to. Excellent. Okay. Is it me now? Yes. Over okay. Thank you. So my name is Alan. Uh, I live in Toronto and uh, uh, I share a house with a seven year old who's doing, uh, what do you call it, remote learning. So if you hear some noises in the background, that's her doing gym. Uh, what else? Thanks to Roshani and Mikey for participating and organizing this. Uh, I am. Um, I'm not very good at public speaking, so I will consult my notes frequently. And uh, uh, that's, that's enough for number one. Number two is, what am I wearing? So some people have noticed that I am wearing something on my head. I call it a buff. And this is thanks to Karen, who had this initiative a few years ago to sponsor something. And this was the, uh, the swag from the sponsors. And uh, between the campfire and the uh, buff, it uh, makes me happy to participate in the CBCRM community because this is the kind of stuff I like. Because I work from my home office and I don't get out too often. Uh, also, I wanted to mention about the the buff. I don't think Karen really uh, knew what people were going to use it for. And uh, at the time, this was like three years ago, um, I didn't really know what a buff was either. But my, my nephews were wearing it to uh, keep their hair out of their eyes when they run. So that's what I do most of the time. But then along came the pandemic. So I started wearing it as a mask all the time, which is super handy because not only is my hair too long and falls in my eyes, when I go out, I often forget my, um, uh, you know, my mask. So I just pull this down and it's a mask. And the reason that's not completely irrelevant is that that's the attitude I wanted to introduce to hosting that, you know, hosting is, and computers in general, they're this tool and we can do what we want with it. Um, so we might as well have fun with it. And they're just, they're just tools. We get to decide how we use them. All right, so next is goals. Uh, so my goal with being involved in CBCRM hosting is, uh, is kind of reluctant. Uh, I started off uh, 15 years ago being a self-employed support or developer. Uh, I started off being a mathematician long before that. And uh, so people hired me to do coding because I knew some coding. And then 15 years ago, I had worked for a little nonprofit doing hosting and they always lost money on the hosting. It looked like a bad idea and hosting was becoming so cheap out there. I thought that's a stupid business to be in. But then I started working with a few different hosts and it was always so frustrating. So I started, I, I just got myself a little server and I started hosting a few people and, and then it worked pretty well. Uh, and then, so I, it was kind of fun too. So the more I, more I uh, did that, I kind of introduced that as part of my business. And then, and then a few years ago, I decided, okay, let's get rid of this business because it's just kind of a side business. Um, and then I looked at all the different options, and they were still kind of annoying. And so then I looked into uh, containers as a as a better solution to what I was doing at the time and uh, spent way too much time looking into Docker and containers. And about, I guess it was three years ago, I converted all my hosting to using Docker and containers. And I still didn't really want to be in the business of hosting. Um, so I'm a little ambivalent. But one of the things I've been trying to do is share how I use containers um, so that other people can do it too. So you'll find uh, a project called Simuliadi, which is kind of nerdy, but it's a uh, species of black fly. Um, so that's why I called it that. And it's 
the idea of that project is to share container uh, hosting of Drupal and Civi CRM. So if you're interested in using containers or, and Docker for hosting Civi CRM, either for development purposes or for production purposes Hello? or for whatever purposes, that's what that process is. I'm hearing somebody in the background. Not talking to me? Okay, good. Okay, so that's number two. Um, oh, and the other thing I wanted to bring in today was to convince you all that hosting is not just a commodity. And that's that's kind of the tension. If you look, if you, you know, Google Civi CRM hosting, you'll see people doing it for five bucks, where it's clearly something that should be bought and sold like a, a, a thing of eggs. And although some parts of hosting is fairly commercial, uh, like the actual physical hosting, that's actually not the interesting part about it. And um, and in fact, if I look at my expenses for hosting, the actual physical part of the hosting is quite small, like maybe 20, 30% of the actual um, cost of hosting. So that's something to keep in mind when you see that five bucks, maybe that's the physical cost cost of hosting and maybe it's not even reliable, but that's actually not the interesting or valuable part of hosting Civi CRM. And I think uh, Mikey's done a good job of describing all the other parts that you need in order to host Civi CRM in production. So that jumps me to three, blah, blah, blah. Oh yeah, I wanted to say something about nonprofits and hosting. And it's a good question, you know, why, um, why does it matter? Why is hosting a nonprofit any different from hosting a for-profit? And of course, part of the answer is it's not hugely different. Um, and so for, we share a lot of the thing, things that uh, commercial hosts use as well. I mean, I use a commercial uh, backend, let's say, the, the actual machines I use are commercially hosted. But one of the things that is different, I think, is values. That if you're a nonprofit, you're not driven solely by money. Obviously, we care about money, but its goal is not to make money. When you're running a business and your goal is to make money, then pretty much everything in your supply chain is a commodity, right? And you want to reduce your costs. Um, whereas if you're working with a nonprofit, it's a little different. You know, you care about the people a little bit more and you care about your values and making sure that your values align with uh, the people you're working with. So for example, I prefer not to work with um, AWS because my values don't align with Jeff Bezos. Sometimes I make use of their services, I have in the past, so it's not a hard and fast rule, but it's something that you have to kind of bring into the equation when you're, when you're hosting a nonprofit, I think. Um, the other obvious thing is that most nonprofits, at least the ones I work with, don't actually have much money compared with corporations. And not a, lots of small corporations don't have money either. Um, but value is very important. So you have to always look at uh, what resources you're using both in my time and uh, in the machine resources that I'm using and trying to be as efficient as possible. Efficiency is kind of a funny word and can be abused, but I think it's important to make good use of your resources. And, you know, it's, it's an environmental thing too. Uh, what else? What else is different in, actually, if, you, if anybody has some thoughts about what makes it different, uh, hosting a nonprofit versus other, feel free to throw it in the chat. Um, for my hosting, one of the things that uh, Karen is good at pointing out is that it's physically hosted in Canada. And sometimes ah. where you're hosted matters to people for some kind of uh, political reasons, like how much the government might be spying on you. Uh, so that can be important for some people too. Uh, what else? Uh, okay, so my next talking point is about, uh, generally about hosting. And I think Mike he's covered this, so I'll be super fast. And that is setting up a Civi CRM site is actually pretty easy. I shouldn't say simple, because if you've never done it, it, you still have to follow instructions. But if you're pretty smart, uh, a do-it-yourself kind of person, and you Google the instructions, you could for sure, you know, get a uh, 
pretty cheap hosting, maybe even $10, $20, maybe even $5 a month if you're clever, um, and do it all, get it running. And that that's true. Uh, and in fact, it's all automatable. My, my little setup now, I can set up a site in you know five minutes by setting up a little config file and going boom. So the point of that is that setting up CVCRM is easy and like installing software, it's in a way too easy because it gives you the illusion that, ah, we'll just throw it out and start again. But the hard part actually of CVCRM hosting is keeping it going and keeping it going safely, securely and robustly and dealing with the possibility of um, failure and change. Um, and not too long ago, it wasn't unreasonable or uncommon for people to say, ah, we'll just kind of set it up and then lock it down and three years later, we'll rebuild the whole thing and start again. And I don't think that was ever a great idea, but it's, it's really not a good idea now because that's not how the software world works. It's, it's now in a, in a state of continual change. And if you try and lock something down for three years, not only will you go out of date in terms of your user experience, you're gonna go out of date in terms of your security um, and your opportunities too. So you, you really have to come to CVCRM with the assumption that it will be continually updated, both the hosting environment um, as well as all the code you're running and figuring out the tools that are there to make it work is really important and part of why it's hard actually to do a managed hosting um, service because you're constantly having to use new tools that are changing and so every time you get some good scripts to automate things you know six months later you have to update them or change them or and then one thing breaks and another thing breaks and you have to do it again. So that's why, um, although physically, you know, the, the actual core machine resources for hosting CIVI is, can be quite cheap, uh, depending on how much, how big your site is. It's never cheap to actually keep the system running properly. All right, I think, uh, what else have I got? Oh yeah, so um, when you're thinking about the different kind of classes of solutions, um, you got VPSs, you've got shared hosting, and you've got managed hosting from a partner like uh, Mikey and I do. Um, and then if you're doing VPS, you can either do it, do it all volunteer or you can hire an expert. And those are the sort of the four, I think, broadly the four options. And I think they're all, they all have their place. I would say if you've got volunteers, um, make sure you're not storing any important client information. And you really have to decide, you know, how valuable is your install to you? And what are the risks if something goes wrong? If it goes offline for a while, or what are the risks if all that data gets exposed somehow? Because it's not uncommon at all that it does get, uh, I think probably people underestimate the, how common it is. If you, you know, read the news, you just look at that, um, last November it was, the um, big network uh, uh, vulnerability that exposed basically all of the US government agencies to hacking and many of them did get hacked. Um, and that's just, you know, people with professional, um, professionals paying attention to it. Um, it's just too easy to, it's too easy to be vulnerable and chances are we're all vulnerable right now. It's just a matter of, we haven't discovered how we're vulnerable. So you should always assume that your systems are vulnerable and will become more vulnerable. You can't just assume that they're safe. So uh, where did that, where was I going with that? That the cost of hosting is really about keeping it safe, secure and performant. All right. So I guess the obvious question is how much does it cost to host CBCRM? and you'll get lots of different answers. And I would say the cheapest, if you're paying less than $25 a month, then um, whether factoring in whatever volunteer cost to maintain it or whatever, if you're paying less than $25, it's hopefully you don't have anything of value in there. Um, and if you have a reasonable, you know, more than 5,000 contacts, you should be paying probably at least 50 bucks a month. 
uh, in total cost. And I'm, I'm including provision for volunteer time there uh, as, as paid, of course. And uh, if you've got a big site, say um, 100,000 or more, then you should probably be paying 100 bucks, 200 bucks sort of thing. So that's my short answer. And of course, as, uh, as I think Mikey said, it really depends on what you're doing and your risk um, comfort and what other resources you have around and how much you care about your site. And I think that's all I will say for now. I've got a few little things that I could talk about. I could talk about my Simuliadi project. Uh, I, could, I could probably do some demos and it would probably go badly. So I probably won't, but um, one of the things I've been meaning to um, post at some point is all the different ways you can upgrade CBCRM because you know there's kind of a canonical way of upgrading and it's fairly painful and risky, um, but really important to upgrade. So how do other people do it? And I've got about four different ways that I've evolved over time and it depends on how I'm hosted and they're kind of all the kind of interesting. Uh, and uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I think we have a few questions for both you and Mikey, if you want to glance through the chat or if somebody wants to unmute themselves and ask their question. And if you can't unmute, just post in the chat here and I can unmute you if needed. Uh, there's a question from John to everyone about one or two sites with very different modules, extensions, and do you see any benefit to containerization or just do a standard server install? So I pretty much have the opinion that um, I would always use containerizing. There is great benefits, uh, and containerization is a kind of complex topic, but the way I think of it is um, to compare it to a standard, you know, lamp or whatever you call it, install on a single server, which is kind of the standard way of doing it. When you've got that, you've got you've got a lot of things happening on that server, um, and they all kind of coexist in a system that was built, I think, in 1972, or depending on how you see that, meaning the birth of Unix, right? And they've got these little processes that are operating and it's up to the operating system to keep them from crashing into each other and, and spying on each other and things like that. That way that computers do multitasking is been around for a long time and it's not terrible, but there's two key limitations with that. One is um, dependency. And if you've ever run into dependency hell putting together a server, you know what I'm talking about. That one program like MySQL or PHP or Apache needs certain other requirements. And if you have a lot of things installed on your server, then you can run into a lot of challenges, particularly the standard one is, oh, I can't upgrade PHP because it something else depends on that. Uh, and one of the things that can, containerization solves is dependency help because all those dependent things are bundled together into a kind of a super process that lives in its own little world. That's, I think, probably the, the main goal of containerization for most of the people who use it. But it also gives you security because the processes within each little, um, within each little container are more insulated from each other, both security-wise and also performance-wise. So you can make sure, for example, uh, here's a good example is when I was running, before I had containers and I was running everybody in the same physical server, and this is true even if you're running only a single site, your MySQL server, if you're doing a massive dedupe, I'm sure everybody's had this before, can really chew up a lot of resources. It's you know crunching into a huge temp table and just eating up all your uh, disk IO or something. To prevent that, if you're using containers, you can limit the number of CPUs and um, other things that it's using. And so resource usage uh, limitations, security and dependency hell are three problems that containers solve in a really beautiful way. And it's, 
particularly the way Docker set up these kind of ways of building containers and managing them is it's quite fun. So that's I, that's my pitch for containers in the answer to John Goldberg's question. I agree with Alan. Uh, we would we would we don't have highly customized instances, but we'd still be going with containers mostly for maintainability. The ability to to maintain each service, each component individually, is just unbelievably valuable. Rich raises a very valid counter to containers, and it is one that you do have to factor in if you're kind of running on a knife edge of performance. Which is if you're running, you know, uh, ten sites with ten um, MySQL or MariaDB containers, you're carrying a little bit of overhead for the fact that you're running some of those core processes multiple times, whereas on a single host you'd be running them once. But I think the relatively minor performance costs of doing that are massively offset by the maintainability and security and scalability containers offer. No, I I, I agree that. Running n MySQLs instead of one is is huge, uh, and also earlier on, the, the, there was concerns about MySQL in a container. Um, so I wasn't always sure that I was going to do that. And you don't have to, right? You could have one SQL serving lots of different sites, each of those running in in um, its own PHP, and that actually solves many of the problems. Um, but I ended up doing separate MySQL, both for both for uh, automation purposes, adding and removing, um, but also there's some, one of the reasons actually I decided to do it, and I, I don't use this reason anymore, is that there's this way of doing um, hot um, transfers of database. So you don't have to do the dump and load. So for a really big database, um, dumping and loading takes a long time, but you can do these hot transfers if you uh, do it for a whole database. If you've got a bunch of databases, uh, sorry, instance. If you if you've got a bunch of databases all in the same instance, you can't use that. Um, but that was actually turned out not to be useful. But uh, it's kind of an interesting thought. I think it's just for me, it's it's about security and um, automation that makes makes it worth it. But for sure, the the database is actually the largest um, memory uh, resource user compared with the PHP for the most part. Rush, but it's worth it. Memory Rush. Steve. Oops, sorry. Yeah, Roshni asked, what are the best practices around data security? Um, that's an in incredibly broad question. It's a great question. I think it's one that's worthy of having its own campfire chat um, just around data security. Um, the, 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 the key point I always try and communicate to customers is that data security, if you're doing it properly, it's a constant process. It's, 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 it's not any kind of static checklist or one thing. It is, it is, it is constant vigilance and, and, and a constant process. Every change you make, every configuration tweak should be at some level or at some point in the process, you should be thinking up through the, the security impacts of it. And you've also got to then monitor your environments in order to have any kind of security. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a process. And it's 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 hugely different for different regulatory environments as well. GDPR imposes a ton of extra data security controls that you know might not be needed in the U.S. on average. Yeah, keeping track of your backups, I would say, also is 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 really important um, for security and uh, privacy reasons. It's really easy to if you look at actually, it's kind of handy to uh, look at the big cases of when there have been security breaches, often they are people who have gotten access to old backups somewhere. Huh. Uh, Clark Hodge says he'd love to hear about the four upgrade methods. So would I. Um, oh. and, and he <laughs> asks, is there any documentation other than the normal? Uh, he says, every month is always a challenge and my stress goes way up. Our back, uh, our upgrade method is 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 pretty extreme, or sounds pretty extreme if you're if you come from a traditional hosting model, because our upgrade methodology essentially involves completely blowing away the CVCRM container and replacing it every time with one that's already up to date. Oh um, yeah, so I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll definitely try and write that up. But the the short answer is. With containers, you actually have a lot of different ways of doing it. Just like my buff, you can use it lots of different ways, often in ways that the inventor didn't even expect. 
So with, with containers, one of the key questions is where does the code live? And the two choices are, well, actually there's three choices and that's why I've got three different ways. One is you can um, put your code on your host so the, the, at the um, server that has the containers and you can sort of symlink that code into the different um, containers that are running that. And I do that with most of my Drupal 7 containers. So to upgrade them, what I do is I um, set it up so that it reloads the uh, container symlinking to the new code base and then I run the DB update. So the individual sites don't have a copy of uh, the CBCRM code base, which for the most part is kind of a lot of space used up that is redundant. But by doing it that way, I also have the flexibility that I can have different versions for different clients if necessary. It's not always a good idea, but at least it's possible. It's very similar to if you symlink the code base in in, a, in an ordinary setup, but it's it's kind of a, a simple and straightforward way to do it. Uh, that's the first one. The second one, uh, you can actually build Civi CRM into your um, into your container, and I have a, a, a kind of a fun thing that I use uh, a project that I use to do that, where I, I have a little build process, which builds a container that includes all of Drupal and CBCRM in the container itself. And then mm. only the client specific stuff gets kind of mounted in with something called a volume. So the actual unique um, customer stuff is actually just the basically sites default files or sites default uh, folder in Drupal, um, plus their database or two databases if you're using separate ones. So that's um, no. that's a kind of no. a e very easy one because I test the upgrade and then I just swap it in with the new container. And then the third one is the more traditional one. And I only use really this on Drupal 8 where the uh, CVCRM code is part of the client uh, files. And for that composer is the magic. And uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't do any other way. Uh, it had a few bumps at the beginning, but using Composer to manage your code bases is, is the way of the future, and it and it works. It, it used to be kind of painful um, because it was so slow, and in the last, if you ever tried it like a year ago, it's it was kind of a dependency hell kind of thing, and slow, but with Composer 2 and the experience now, it's really quite a, a joy to see it work um, with, with Drupal 8 or Drupal 9 and CBCRM these days. So that's what I use. I'd agree with that. The Composer 2 is a, 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 a very get it, good get list. It. Um, there are other questions. Uh, Don asks, does Eric, does each container run in a separate virtual machine? Uh, the, the way we run it, no. Um, we run it on uh, Azure Container Service, which is based on Kubernetes. Um, so for us, each each of our customers runs in their own Azure tenant, which we have some delegated permissions to access. Um, so that everything is under the customer's ownership. We don't kind of own their hosting because that was a bit of a, a weird area. We didn't like getting into kind of it being in our tenant as it were. Uh, so it, it adds some complexity, but it, it, it seems to work quite well for, for what our customers need. And we've got a, all of the scripting set up. I'm not sure about Alan. Uh, are we answering the question about orchestration here? Uh, sorry, does each container run in a separate virtual machine? Ah, definitely not. Uh, so actually, I don't. I don't love virtual machines. I I run on, I guess they call it bare metal. So I have my own physical servers, and then I run all my containers on several different physical servers. Uh, so it's kind of a cloud type. It's kind of how cloud systems work, um, cloud. but they're sort of manually managed. And I don't really use all the cloud kind of things. Um, a cloud setup would have the the file system uh, I'll connect to all of the front end machines, and I don't do that. Um, but the question about can orchestration is, is uh, worthwhile. Kubernetes kind of took over the thing called orchestration and um, 
and it says, yet they have deprecated Docker. Well, I think that's a, definitely an oversimplification. Kubernetes is the industrial strength orchestrator, but it doesn't, that's really not the whole story. There's a lot of decisions you have to make regardless of whether you use Kubernetes. I actually still use Swarm, which is still supported. Um, and I actually have a, two clients who I set up using Docker Compose uh, with multi sites on a single physical server. And uh, that's still working as well. Uh, so there's different ways of doing it. And uh, I found Kubernetes was more complexity than I needed. and um, the thing that they're called orchestrating is is sort of only part of the challenge of getting everything together. So um, I think I've got a, a little post about that in my series, if you want to get a longer answer to that. Yeah, we use Kubernetes to orchestrate ours, but again, we run it as a, a very homogenous managed service and we are performing simultaneous operations across, you know, 40 sites at a time and it's all scripted. Kubernetes makes sense for us in that environment, but it doesn't make sense kind of managing a site or a couple of sites. Um, it, it would be massive overkill for that, I would say. And I, yeah, I would probably have reached the same decision as Alan if we if we had fewer sites that we were managing or we weren't homogenous if we had bespoke sites. And uh, does, can, does containerization limit the possibility or impact of malware ransom attacks? That's a great question from Kathy. I love it. Fantastic question. Uh, I'm just going to read out what I put in the chat. Uh, it, it, it limits their impact. It doesn't really limit the possibility because um, that's down to how things are configured, but it definitely limits their impact because if you're containerized and you get a ransom attack, chances are it's confined to that, that Docker network, that, that set of containers. Uh, I like to feel that containers is uh, definitely has a security improvement in that it gives you more layers to weed out potential attacks. So they call them attack vectors, you know, directions. Um, by having fewer processes running in the same space, you have less chance of these attacks that make use of multiple uh, vulnerabilities that impact each other. Um, and, but to be honest, the, the key is, is, is not this or that. It's security can be done well or badly regardless of using containers or not. My concern with a lot of container setups is that they're so complicated that people miss some of the obvious things. Um, and I would say secure complexity is, is one of the biggest problems when, when trying to deal with security. Uh, wow, we have so many questions still. And uh, Mikey, is there a channel on Mattermost that you recommend if people want to continue this conversation? We have a or... dedicated Docker channel. Uh, if, if Docker is specifically kind of what you're looking to converse about, we have a dedicated channel for Docker. Uh, I think there's been some discussion about renaming it just to kind of containerization, which I think will probably happen because Docker is one of a few containerization options. Um, I did just to, they, 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 I realized we've kind of talked a lot about containers and not explained what they are. Um, the closest analogy, I suppose, would be that a container is in reality just a very tiny virtual machine. It's just a very tiny kind of self-contained mini computing environment that shares some resources with other containers, like a, an operating system kernel. Usually that's shared amongst all of your containers. Um, but yeah, generally it's just it's just a, a, a way of breaking up computing tasks and isolating them from other computing tasks. It's a sandbox. Or you could think of it as a super process. That's how I think of it as. That's yeah, yeah, that's a great explanation. That's a <laughs> coming great from the other end. Yeah, absolutely. They're both um, of those things. Uh, Rich says, Do you run Docker as a non root user? Yes, we run Docker as a non non root user from our end at least. Well we are at time. Um, I really want to thank you guys for taking the time to share information about containerization. I think it, it might have gone above some of our heads that are not <laughs> software developers, but um, I, I hope we can continue this conversation on Mattermost and also on Stack Exchange as needed. Um, and we'll share the recording with everyone afterwards and the collaborative notes. 
uh, Mikey and Ellen, um, if you have any links you want to add to the collaborative notes as well, we can share those out. And um, any final thoughts as we get it, get ready to wrap up, Mikey and Ellen? Thank you, Roshni, for organizing. Thank you, Alan, for kind of uh, coming along and, and speaking with me. Um, you know, I, I think there was a period where I was the person signed up to speak for this, and it was just me, and I was I was a bit terrified. So thank you so much <laughs> for, for coming in. Um, and it's great to hear about your environment and how things work. And I realize we've kind of taken a what was I think supposed to be kind of general hosting CVS REM. And because it turns out we both use containers, it's been fairly containerization focused. If you do have more questions, if you do, if you are looking for just general hosting help or recommendations, the sysadmin channel on Mattermost, you can always pop into there, um, ask your questions, and generally get some kind of some, some expert help from people who are hosting CVSRM every which way you can imagine from one guy I know who hosts it in on a, a little Raspberry Pi in his dining room, um, right up to, you know, guys who are kind of the, pushing the cutting edge of containers and doing things that uh, are, are like technical wizardry. So, yeah. Alan, any final thoughts? Oh, I don't know. Mike, you did a good Great. job of expressing well, thank my you final guys thoughts. so much. And um, we'll continue this discussion. I'll grab the chat from here as well and add that to the um, shared collaborative notes. And um, more soon regarding the next month's uh, campfire chat. And it's going to be again on the last Friday of every month. So hope to see you guys then. And uh, please. Be safe. I know everyone is in different environments right now where things are opening up in some places and not so good in others. So continue to be supportive of, of each other, your neighbors and communities and um, hope to see you all again next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Thanks all.